Awesome. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, why AI applications don't work in production uh, and a survey of like AI reliability. Uh, and to get started, you know, I'm Shreya, I'm the CEO at Guardrails AI, uh, have worked in machine learning for many years and, you know, excited to really dig into uh, what it takes to build the next generation of, you know, reliable AI and what what's kind of like the gap between a lot of AI applications as they stand today and what's kind of like coming up on the horizon. Um, Awesome. So before we get started, uh, a little bit about me and, uh, you know, uh, my background, uh, as I mentioned, CEO and co-founder at Guardrails AI. Uh, in the past, uh, I worked in, uh, you know, multiple areas in machine learning for many years, um, uh, especially around, uh, you know, uh, starting out in like classical AI and deep learning research for a number of years, where I published uh, a bunch of papers and, you know, planning under uncertainty and computer vision. Uh, I then worked in self-driving cars for many years. Um, so at a small startup and, and then a larger company that acquired that startup. Um, and then uh, most recently, I was the ML Infra lead uh, at an ML ops company, uh, you know, based in San Francisco before spinning out and starting guardrails. Awesome. So with that out of the way, um, you know, why we're all here is we're seeing this like Cambrian explosion of applications in AI uh, over the last 18 months, especially with the release of ChatGPT, you know, the number of uh, tooling and infrastructure that's kind of been built to support AI applications has been like pretty substantial. And that has led to, you know, like a huge amount of like exuberance about the um, about the impact that AI can have, uh, you know, across all of these like um, uh, different domains and use cases. So, for example, like uh, software engineering um, is, uh, you know, here's this tweet about like how impacted software engineering will be, um, you know, that AI will be better than, you know, many, many different types of coders, etc. Uh, AI for mental illness and, you know, like um, uh, AI for like companionship, uh, generative AI and the impact for, of it in sales, etc. Um, but at the same time, even with this Cambrian explosion, you know, the uh, reality of how usable AI is, is very different. So for example, even though ChatGPT had one of the fastest like path to 100 million users, uh, the retention for ChatGPT tends to be lower than, you know, a lot of the earlier like non AI based consumer applications. And we can kind of see here that, you know, AI first companies in general see like much lower retention than like non AI based companies, right? So the idea is that AI isn't like sufficient or isn't just enough. Um, but that's kind of like not the sentiment that's reflected in, you know, a lot of the infrastructure and tooling investments, right? So, for example, here's this like question about like um, the number of investments in just uh, pure like hardware infrastructure for AI, which is, you know, um, um, on track to be around like 50 billion or so by the end of like next year, I believe. Um, and essentially, the big question that's facing all of us that are building in generative AI on the future of generative AI is like, how do we build applications that use all of this infrastructure to kind of like justify that exuberance or spend, right? Like, where's this gap between like all of the enthusiasm? Where's the raw impact that AI kind of has today on our application stack? So another way to kind of like look at this question, right, is like, where are the production grade LLM applications today? So uh, for business critical use cases, what's holding back enterprises from being able to use AI effectively? Um, and to answer that question, let's dig deeper into, you know, this um, uh, this uh, example of what happens when uh, AI applications are shipped, you know, like prematurely. So here I have an example of uh, a chatbot that was created by Chevrolet of Watsonville. Um, and then, you know, as the team kind of like built this chatbot, um, I think a bunch of people, you know, managed to get like really unusual outputs and results from this chatbot. So, for example, uh, here's an example of somebody who, you know, got this chatbot to sell, agree to sell uh, him like a Chevy Tahoe for a dollar. Uh, and, you know, the chatbot says like no takesies, backsies. So obviously, obviously, like that's a legally binding agreement that this person can use. Uh, this other one is, you know, um, essentially um, examples of lawyers being sanctioned for uh, relying on AI citations or AI tools without necessarily understanding all of the limitations of AI. Uh, all of these examples were taken from the same week, like this basically, you know, like in the same week, like um, all of these issues kind of like happened. Um, so essentially the big concern that ends up happening is that enterprises mentioned 
And then using generative AI opens them up to a lot of risk. How do we prevent these risks? Um, and the answer here is reliable AI. So what is reliable AI under the hood, essentially? So reliable AI, you know, relates to a lot of these like similar kinds of like sentiments around AI governance, reliable AI, AI alignment, even the philosophical idea of, you know, like guardrails for AI application. Um, but essentially underneath all of this, the core idea for reliable AI um, is that you're using this one piece of infrastructure that allows you to, you know, behave in like many, many different ways, right? It allows you to, for example, like write SQL queries. The same model can tell you how to write a poem about the 49ers losing the Super Bowl. Uh, and it can help you, for example, like write an article about the modern data stack, right? And all of these applications are very diverse and very, very different from each other. So when you have a technology that can do like all of these things under the hood, um, how do you make it do like a single objective, which is typically what you need for, you know, enterprise AI use cases, right? So if you're an enterprise and you are building and shipping an AI application, you don't want that AI application to answer all of these questions. You want it to answer the single question. Let's say, you know, it's helping your customers with like, you know, issues with accessing your enterprise application about, you know, why can't I log into my account, right? And you want it to answer that question uh, as effectively as, um, you know, correctly and as aligned with what you want as an organization as possible, right? Rather than like being this really flexible tooling. So the core idea is how do we make this like um, really powerful model that can do like everything under the sun, uh, be very constrained and do the single task really well. Awesome. So with that definition kind of set, uh, what methodologies are being used today to make AI systems reliable? Um, and this is, you know, where we kind of like enter the survey. Um, all right. So the evaluation criteria for, you know, as we, as we like go into the survey, we're basically going to like talk through a bunch of different like methodologies for using AI applications. Uh, and then, um, the criteria that we'll use to evaluate how effective these methodologies are, uh, are like the following, um, efficacy. This is specifically from the perspective of like reliability. So how effectively is my risk reduced? Uh, the cost and latency. So these are pretty like self-explanatory, but essentially what's the cost of adding this reliability technique to my AI application? And then what's the latency, right? Like at the end of the day, you're doing like some work to make sure your AI application is reliable. How much extra latency is added to your AI application to kind of like make this work? Uh, customizability. Is this reliability technique like customizable for my use case? Uh, and then controllability. Uh, how much control does this give me over my LLM application? And then finally, ease of use. Like how easy is this to implement? Uh, all right. So to start with, you know, the first te uh, reliability technique that we'll kind of like start with here is RAG or retrieval augmented generation. Uh, re retrieval augmented generation, how it kind of like works is that, you know, rather than using the LLM with only its internal knowledge, which is, you know, the training data that it was kind of trained on, which, you know, in most cases is, you know, the entire like uh, internet that is scraped and a lot of like, you know, uh, news articles, et cetera. Um, instead of just relying on the model's internal knowledge, how about we provide it, you know, some relevant context, uh, either private or public that we trust and that we want to condition on the model's knowledge, right? Uh, and then so just asking, instead of asking questions directly, how do we provide it with like relevant context uh, so that it's able to answer those questions much more correctly? Uh, looking at RAG specifically from the perspective of reliability, uh, you know, the efficacy of this application is um, uh, for reliability is pretty limited. Um, so uh, essentially, like the efficacy ends up being pretty limited for like reliability. Uh, you know, if you're looking at RAG only from the perspective of like reliability, it ends up being like not as effective. Um, the cost of RAG is actually pretty decent. Um, yes, you do have longer prompts that leads to like longer, you know, like higher token counts on the input side and everything, but overall, like nothing too bad. Um, the latency and customizability end up being like pretty great. Um, so this is actually, I think, like a big reason for why uh, RAG is used like pretty, uh, pretty extensively, uh, as well as, you know, the ease of use of RAG ends up being like pretty great. 
Uh, controllability, like how controllable is it in terms of like adding reliability to your AI application? Uh, not too much, right? Like this is not one of the most effective models uh, of adding reliability. Uh, and then the key challenge with respect to reliability really ends up being that RAG is essentially prompting on steroids. So what you're doing in RAG is like retrieving what is the most relevant context and then just adding it to your prompt, right? Uh, but prompting doesn't offer any guarantees. And that's kind of like the key concern and question here, which is that even if you have like the best possible prompt, you know, and you'll ask the model to only respond like from the information that's given in the prompt, there's no guarantees that that model is going to like listen to whatever you whatever constraints you kind of like put in. Uh, the second, like, very, very common AI reliability technique is uh, LLM self-evaluation. Uh, and this is a pretty, like, complex model to represent what LLM self-evaluation is. Uh, but essentially, the fundamental idea is pretty simple. And it is that, you know, uh, if you, um, uh, instead of just using the LLM by itself, uh, you pass the output of the LLM back to the LLM and ask it to kind of, like, check its work, right? So is this uh, output correct? And is this something that I can kind of trust is, is, is a judgment that a second LLM call kind of like makes until you're like satisfied with like what that answer kind of like ends up being. Once again, looking at this specifically from the perspective of like AI reliability, um, the efficacy of um, LLM self-evaluation as an AI reliability tool ends up being, you know, not great. Um, you have the classic problem of like, if I can, you know, not trust the LLM model in the first place, how do I kind of like stack these LLM calls? Like, how do I get, you know, like a lot of reliability from there? Um, cost, latency, and controllability, um, you know, leave a lot to be desired. Like, essentially, you're, like, doubling or tripling the number of, like, LLM calls that you make, which adds a lot of latency, adds a lot of cost. Uh, controllability also, like, leaves a lot to be desired because you're not sure in which, in how, like, the errors of the LLM are kind of going to occur. Uh, customizability and ease of use are absolutely fantastic. It's really easy to write a prompt to just kind of like check the output of the LLM, you know, by itself. Uh, and that's typically what you end up doing, which is why this technique is used like pretty commonly. Uh, but again, it's like not a very like reliable technique. Uh, key challenge with respect to reliability, uh, do we trust the LLM's like own evaluation of itself? Uh, you know, so it's like, how do we, how do we, uh, who guards the guards is kind of like the uh, Latin translation, uh, the English translation of this like Latin quote here. So essentially, like, if we don't trust the LLM in the first place, you know, how do we kind of like stacking LLMs? How do we kind of like make it trust its own evaluation? And that's kind of like the key change here. Um, the third technique that we'll kind of like look at in our survey is RLXF or fine tuning. Um, essentially, the idea here is like you kind of like train a model. And then once you have a model trained, you essentially like look at the outputs of that model and then try to align it with, you know, uh, some kind of like reward or like human model that you can kind of like trust. Uh, and that's kind of like the key idea, which is that you, uh, after you train the model on the first pass, you kind of like look at its outputs uh, with like um, with like a reward model, like either a human based or an AI based reward model, reward model that essentially gives feedback uh, on the outputs of your AI applications, and you keep like getting that feedback uh, and essentially you know updating the weights of your model based on that feedback until you end up getting like outputs that are you know um uh, that that fit your criteria of what's acceptable uh, all right so looking at rlxf and fine tuning from the perspective of ai reliability efficacy this is fantastic right so uh, essentially you end up like getting a model just from the baseline that's like much more aligned uh, with what you want and you can for example like make it pay attention to instructions much more uh, correctly whatever your criteria is for uh, reliability you can you know emphasize that criteria a lot in your feedback and you'll end up getting you know like a model that you know just by default like works really well latency is really great because in runtime you're not like making doing any extra computation all of the extra computation or work is really done like uh, before you even get to the inference stage, you know, it's done at like training stage. And so in real time latency, you don't end up incurring like any extra cost. Uh, customizability is kind of hard. And this is just because like, you know, fine tuning or uh, reinforcement learning from AI or human feedback is just generally kind of hard. So in order to, you know, like introduce like new criteria that you want to like update the model on ends up being like pretty, pretty technically kind of like challenging. And then 
then finally, cost controllability and ease of use end up being like really, really challenging because um, once again, you know, you uh, don't really have um, uh, you essentially need to like um, update the model rates. And then you end up getting into this classic problem of any time you need to do that, which is you need a lot of data to be able to do it. Right. And data is once again, one of the most expensive parts of machine learning. Uh, not everybody has access to high quality data, um, has access to the volume of data that is typically needed um, or the infrastructure to kind of like train and update these models. Um, and then with RLXF uh, or fine tuning, you end up like being bottlenecked by that data or just that raw feedback in some sense. Right. So how how do you kind of like make those updates ends up being pretty challenging. Um, all right. So the key challenge, if you look at it from the perspective of reliability, even though this is like really effective in practice, as you're implementing it, you have to offset uh, the upfront cost or investment of the data and the feedback that's kind of really needed for these models. Um, and then finally, you know, the last air reliability technique that we look at is like input and output guardrails. Uh, the idea behind like input and output guardrails is <coughs> pretty straightforward. So the idea essentially is that let's say you have, you know, like some AI application uh, and then within that AI application, you have, you know, this LLM module uh, and the LLM module typically is like prompt LLM out LLM and then the LLM kind of like generates an output, right? So this might be like different things depending on your different use cases. But typically, like if you're doing a lot of AI engineering, like most of your engineering investment kind of goes in here, right? On the prompt level. Uh, once you add guardrails to this AI framework, like essentially the only difference is that instead of passing the prompt raw to your LLM, you'll first pass it through this like input guard. And then instead of like using the output raw in your application, you'll first pass it through this output guard, right? So what does this look like for input and output guards? On the input guard side, essentially you make sure that, you know, you can make sure that your input is acceptable and is something you're comfortable using in your application uh, or, you know, like leaving your uh, environment or system to an external model to make a call. So for example, like making sure that there's no PII that is contained in your input before you make a request to your AI application, or, you know, you're not getting questions that maybe contain a jailbreak attempt or, or, or are off topic. Um, on the output side, essentially making sure that there's no hallucinations uh, in the output or, you know, not me making sure that there's no profanity generated. So explicitly testing kind of like for hallucinations, for profanity, if you're building a commercial application, maybe testing for like mentions of competitors, et cetera, right? All of these things are things you can like explicitly verify. All right, now looking at guardrails, like input output guardrailing from a perspective of, uh, you know, efficacy and effectiveness, so um, efficacy and cost actually end up being like pretty great. So because you're explicitly testing for risks here, uh, you know, you end up getting like a quantified, you don't have to make like a leap of faith or something. You actually end up getting like a quantified like um, um, estimate of how likely that harmful behavior in your LM is likely to occur. And then cost, because these end up being like pretty small task specific models, the cost ends up being like pretty low as well. Latency, customizability, not as great, uh, you know, latency, essentially, fundamentally, you're adding like more computation or more work to your AI application. And so that definitely in, in introduces a lot of latency. Uh, customizability um, is also hard, even though each guardrail is customizable, you have to basically do like more work or like develop a small like machine learning model fundamentally, uh, in order to like customize a guardrail, which you know, not many like it's possible that you know not everybody who is an AI engineer has kind of the skill to like develop those like low cost models. Um, controllability is great because you can really mix and match um, and like only add the guardrails that you really care about. Uh, ease of use uh, might leave something to be desired because you know again um, you need to kind of like customize this guardrail based on what you want, which you know um, uh, is is definitely an investment. Um, the key challenge with respect to reliability, even though guardrails like work really well, is how do we build guardrails for every type of risk that we want to guard against, right? So maybe there's like some risk that kind of like come out of the box, but for other things we want to do, how do we kind of like guardrail against that? Awesome. Uh, key challenges in AI reliability method methodologies, right? So we looked at all of these techniques. Now let's look at kind of like open challenges and like what uh, the issues, if we were to kind of like summarize them, like end up like looking like, et cetera. So the first is that instructions aren't guarantees. 
um, a lot of AI applications like how they're built today, uh, you know, essentially end up like almost relying on um, the like relying too much on prompt engineering, where we give a lot of like instructions in the prompt and then we expect those instructions to be followed. Right. But that is not always the case. Uh, and that is kind of like the key gap between like why uh, like the techniques that people are employing versus like the fundamental limitations of the models. Uh, so, for example, you know, like if you've ever tried generating JSON from any of these models, you know that, you know, return only JSON, do not include a preamble to your answer um, is like a very uh, common, like uh, common prompt to try to get like only JSON. Um, I work with AI engineers that have, you know, like I, I think you you know, threaten like bodily harm, et cetera, to the LLM to try to like get it to behave. Um, so someone will die if, you know, you don't like respond in a certain manner, et cetera, right? And so there's a lot of like this prompt hacking, which um, still doesn't guarantee that whatever instructions you include, like will be adhered to by your LLM. Second is that uh, customizability for, you know, uh, your AI behavior is a necessity. Um, there's no universally correct um, understanding of what like, you know, an LLM should behave like. Uh, many people use these models for very, very diverse, very different types of applications. And in some sense, they should almost be like programmable in the way that, you know, your uh, typical in infrastructure components are. Um, so, for example, like, let's look at, you know, like different types of behaviors of those models and like how they might be like perceived either positively or negatively, uh, depending on what applications they're kind of used in. Um, so let's say profanity, right? Uh, if there's profanity in your AI output, like typically that's perceived like pretty negatively. If you're an enterprise, for example, that's building like a customer support application, let's say. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're building something like an AI companion or maybe using it for like creative writing use cases, then profanity might be perceived as being like very authentic, right? Um, a polite tone in your AI application. So um, let's say that, you know, like a very polite tone might be like, um, uh, perceived as like very distant, uh, again, in the, in the use case of like AI companions, et cetera, it might be, you know, not, or not, uh, not a tone that, you know, like a mental health coach might want to take, for example, but a very positive perception of it may be like, that's very professional. Um, awesome. And then financial advice, you know, again, like financial advice is very helpful if you're, um, advising people, you know, if you're taking on, let's say building an AI financial advisor, uh, but on the flip side, the negative perception of financial advice is that it may end up being like very, very risky, right? Or it may open up your application to a lot of like risk. Uh, for example, if you're building like anything in a regulated industry with like finance. So uh, customizability of the AI behavior based on audience context and use cases is key. And this often gets like very underemphasized in terms of, you know, when people talk about like building safeguards for AI applications, right? And then the third is the ability to measure the performance of the AI application. So, um, you know, I, I don't want you to index on like this specific like graph here, but let's say for any other application to build up, right? Um, the AI models are any other like a non AI application that we end up building up. Like, you know, we have like this really detailed like observability of like where is the risky behavior of that AI application. And typically, that's not something that's very easy to do for, um, you know, um, um, AI based models, right? So, how many times is my model hallucinating? Or how many times does it refuse to answer a question, uh, even though it kind of like shouldn't, or, you know, even though that question is like within my acceptable use or something, right? Like, these are all important questions that are very like abstract that makes it kind of like hard to measure. Um, awesome. So we have all of these challenges. How do we address these challenges, uh, you know, like in an open manner, like primarily from an open source perspective? Um, and this is kind of like the, the idea behind like Guardrails Hub, which is like our opinion on like how to basically like build a lot of the infrastructure tooling that's necessary for uh, improving AI reliability. Um, so open source, uh, the Guardrails Hub basically is an open source platform with very high quality implementations of Guardrails for various use cases. Um, there's plug and play guardrails that can be configured and customized, you know, again, across a lot of use cases. Uh, and there's a lot of like templates and recipes for ease of use. Um, so some specific features of like guardrails hub and like what makes it like really easy to kind of like use across a bunch of use cases. Uh, the first is it kind of like comes with a lot of like 
uh, validators pre-implemented for you. So there's 50 plus validators uh, across across you know many different types of like risks and AI applications and use cases that you can kind of like uh, get started with right out of the bat. There are input and output guardrails that you can kind of like use, uh, both for making like input guards and output guards. And then you get a lot of like um, um, infrastructure support right out of the box. So you can support like streaming. So you can stream res stream and validate resp uh, responses, you know, like in real time if you use like um, guardrails. And there's also like very low latency orchestration of like running multiple guardrails across various use cases. And finally, you can like configure and customize like any guardrail that you kind of want to use under the hood. Um, here are some examples of what integrating like guardrails into your applications kind of look like. So let's say you want to like uh, mitigate hallucination in your AI application. You know, um, being able to do that is like as simple as like you know guardrails hub install, and then basically like you know creating a guard that essentially detects and mitigates that. Um, if you wanted to like restrict your chatbot to certain topics only, once again, guardrails hub install like the restricted topic guardrail. Uh, and then, you know, essentially like configure which topics are valid to talk about, maybe like food and cars and which are like invalid topics like politics. All right, so with that out of the box, let's uh, go into the demo part of you know what it looks like to uh, actually work with like apply guardrails to your AI application in real time. Awesome. So just to kind of like, as I'm going to set, set up this uh, demo that I'm going to kind of showcase, uh, you know, on the left, we kind of have um, a chatbot that does not have any guardrails in place. And on the right is a chatbot like with guardrails in place. Uh, they're being asked the exact same questions and then getting the exact same kind of like responses out of the box. Um, all right, so the first uh, question that we'll kind of like go through or the first like prompt that we'll pass to these responses is a jailbreak prompt, right? Uh, so this is a many shot jailbreak that was re released by Anthropic uh, about a month ago now. Um, and then like for this jailbreak, uh, the interesting thing is that there's no like amount of fine tuning or RLHF, for example, that can like make the model um, impervious to this jailbreak. So the only way to kind of like prevent this jailbreak is to, you know, um, uh, essentially like detect when it's happening on the prompt side and kind of like uh, massage or, or kind of like uh, manage the prompt, right? So if we send this jailbreak, which is essentially, you know, asking this question after giving a lot of my short examples, how do I break a bike lock, right? Um, you can essentially kind of see that with using the right guardrails, you can like block this jailbreak attempt. And then without using the guardrail, you end up getting like, you know, a lot of these like responses about how to dispose the lock, etc. Um, let's say, you know, we now want to ask our model, like, like, tell me about something that tell me about a person who, you who, you know, like works at an Anthropic. And for example, like maybe Anthropic or any organization is something that, you know, we want to flag and then, you know, PII is something we want to flag. So obviously this is a very contrived example of where the prompt like necessitates that output behavior, which is to kind of demonstrate how guardrails like, you know, real time look like in practice. Um, and essentially, you can end up kind of like seeing that you can like block the names of certain organizations, PII, emails, etc. can be kind of blocked. And finally, we look at like one that, you know, um, generates and mitigates kind of hallucinations. Uh, you ask a question maybe about something and you can kind of see that, you know, the sentence that is hallucinated uh, gets highlighted as those hallucinations are kind of like detected. Awesome. So... Um, cool. So that was kind of like the demo uh, of, you know, working with guardrails in real time in your AI application. Um, and uh, with that, we can actually get to the question stage of this uh, presentation. Um, yeah, to stay in touch, you know, you can take a look at like, um, uh, check out like hub.guardrailsai.com as well as take a look at any of these uh, links that I've kind of shared. All right, I'll hold for a couple of minutes for minutes for questions.
Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there is a way to kind of like reformat the answer. Essentially, a lot of the hard part about guardrails is like detecting when bad things are happening, right? Uh, and then what we do is we kind of like flag that to you and then we provide a lot of like um, alternatives for how you can kind of like fix the uh, fix the bad behavior once you identify it, including like reformatting the answer. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, I, I see one more question. Um, do guardrails need to be tuned based on the LLM being used, or should they work for all? Uh, that is a great question. I would say that, uh, yeah, the, architecturally, guardrails kind of work for all LLM models. Um, so they're more kind of like determined on the application that you kind of like are designing rather than the model that you're kind of using. Yeah. So for the same application, you'll typically use like the same guardrails. Uh, another question by uh, Adi, um, the demo showed capturing issues on the response. How does it work when you identify issues in the request itself? Most of the examples um, you showed should be caught in the request rather than the response. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. You can identify like either of those things. For example, like hallucinations are in the response. Like you can only detect hallucinations in the response. But that's kind of like the differentiation between like input guardrails and output guardrails. Input gu guardrails really work on the input side and they can catch requests in the they can catch uh, bad behavior on the request side. So for example, the jailbreak attempt that we detected, like that was blocked on the request side and that request was basically like not forwarded to the model. So the model never kind of like saw that jailbreak attempt. All right, a question by uh, Motorita. Um, do you have any guardrails ensuring reproducibility of outputs? That is important when trying to use Gen AI in scientific research. That is a really fantastic question. Um, unfortunately not, so reproducibility um, is something that, you know, kind of happens like across multiple AI calls, right? So for example, like it's hard to, it's hard to look at like one single call and make a, de make a determination of like, is this reproducible or not? You have to kind of look at like multiple calls kind of like in sequence or something. Um, guardrails typically works on the level of like one AI call. Uh, one way to kind of like implement this is like do this once and then kind of like check if the answer is like being, um, if you're getting the exact like string to string match of the answer that you're kind of like expecting. But that's a, that's a really fantastic question. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for joining uh, the presentation and really appreciate all the questions. And uh, thanks again for, for us and the rest of the team for, you know, sending me the invite. Thanks, everyone. Bye.